Hello, this is Dr. J here with the second video of my Commander X16 devlog. I'd like to start this one with a quick acknowledgement and a note. I would like to thank commenter Josh C3353 and forum member Jimmy Dansbo for directing my attention to another sound library called ZSM Kit. And both of them pointed out that Z Sound is no longer being actively developed while ZSM Kit is, and that ZSM Kit has features that Z Sound does not. However, when I looked into ZSM Kit, the documentation says that it's geared toward assembly projects, and it also has example builds for BASIC and PROG8, but it didn't appear to have one for C, even though it uses the CC65 compiler suite. It does have build instructions, but they say that they assume you're familiar with creating custom CC65 linker configs, and I am, well, not. In all honesty, my compilation skills are fairly simplistic. I can put together a makefile to compile a bunch of source files and specify include in library folders, and specify targets for how to run a project once it's been compiled, but that's honestly about it. And in addition, although ZSound is not actively maintained at present, it does work. And as long as the relevant kernel functionality doesn't change out from under it in a way that breaks uh, its assumptions, then there's no harm in continuing to use it. So for those reasons, I'm going to continue using ZSound for the time being. But if anyone can share detailed instructions on how to build it with a C project in mind, feel free to share and I'll give it a try. I'm as much a learner here as a teacher, so I'm more than happy to acquire any knowledge that others want to share. And even though for the time being I've decided to stick to ZSound, I once again do want to thank uh, Josh C3353 and Jimmy Dansbo for pointing me to ZSM Kit. Okay, so with that out of the way, I want to start this video by showing how I've configured and set up my development environment so other people can follow along and emulate my environment if they want to or at least see it as an example. Now unfortunately, I just had a major computer failure on my primary computer, so I'm having to set up everything again on one of my backup computers. It's kind of frustrating and time-consuming. It's set me back by a day making videos and working on X16 development. But on the upside, that does mean that I have a somewhat fresher environment to demonstrate how to set things up, although I was able to copy some aspects of my environment off of the uh, computer that has basically broken. Uh, I can still get files off of it, but it's currently not in a usable state. All right, so I'm doing my development on Windows. Personally, I use both Windows and Linux computers, so I'll try to give explanations for how to do setup on both. I'm afraid that Mac users will be on their own because I don't have any Apple hardware to test it out on, Although, hopefully a lot of these instructions should still work or be easily adaptable to Mac computers if that's what you're using. All right, now let's go ahead and go through the steps to get our development environment set up. Now, funnily enough, I already recorded this, spent most of last evening recorded this, recording this, only to realize that my recording software had cut off half of my screen. So. I had to trash all of that and starting over from scratch. Uh, but you're not here to listen to my technical problems. You're here for retro game development. So let's just go ahead and put that aside and go through this again. Well, again for me, first time for you. So first thing is we're going to need the Commander X16 emulator. Uh, you probably already have it if you're watching this, but just in case, go to commanderx16.com. And at least as of this recording, you will see a link to download the emulator in the lower right corner of the X16 website. And we'll go to the topic about the Commander X16 emulator, and then it will have R and a release number, which currently is 46. In the future, it will probably be higher. Follow the link, and it'll take us to the GitHub page where we can go ahead and find the download for whatever our platform is. In this case, I'm currently on a Windows 64 system, 64-bit, so I'll go ahead and download that. Save it wherever you like. <clears throat> and then go ahead and just unzip it. All right, now let's change the folder name to 
simply x16 emu. I know that that should probably be pronounced emu for emulator, but I like the word emu, so emu. And in here, you'll see a whole bunch of files, um, including a couple programmer references, the commander x16 programmer's reference, which is a very large document and also the Vera programmer's reference, which not quite as large, but still pretty large. All kinds of advanced technical detail in these documents. So uh, if, you, if you need a reference for how some technical things work, well, you've got some pretty thorough ones to come with the emulator download. So that's pretty nice. There's also a readme. And of course, we also have the main attraction which is the <clears throat> uh, x16 emu executable itself. If you just run that, and you get a nice, fully functional Commander x16 emulator with that nostalgic old school blue screen background and the cool Commander x16 logo in the upper left. All right, and that's all there is to it. We are not going to do very much uh, just firing up the emulator like that for our development. We're going to write compilation scripts that will just automatically execute this and run our program, uh, load and run our program as part of executing it. Um, we'll be getting into that shortly. With the emulator downloaded, next thing that we're going to need in order to write our programs in C is the CC65 compiler. So I'll go ahead and do a search for that, and the top result here is the one I want, CC65, a freeware C compiler for 6502 base systems. So web page should look something like this. We'll just go down to links where we have the source code or a Windows snapshot if, uh, if you're on Windows like I currently am at the moment. So I'll go ahead and grab the Windows snapshot and give this a download. All right, that went nice and fast. Uh, depending on your browser, it may complain that this is not a commonly downloaded file. So I'll go ahead and tell it to keep. No, I really mean it. I know what I'm doing. Keep anyway. Stop trying to protect me, you silly operating system. All right, and then it downloads for us. Now, because I'm recording this for the second time, uh, I've already unzipped this folder, but obviously just unzip it <clears throat> and you'll get the CC65 folder. And uh, what you're gonna want is inside the bin folder here, you're gonna find all of these executable files. And what you're going to need to do in order to make compilation easy to do on the command line is we're going to want to add these to our path environment variable so that when we have a terminal window open we can just type whatever the compiler is that we want like cl65 for example and hit enter and instead of the terminal complaining it doesn't know what we're talking about having it say actually try to run it and say something like no input files which is completely true we didn't give it any input files so in my case it's already working but uh, when you download it, like I said, you're going to want to add these to your path environment variable. If you don't know how to do that, then in search, if you just put in path, you should get something like edit the system environment variables. Now, depending on your version of Windows and so on, the exact way to get to this uh, configuration window might vary. But basically, you just want to get to this system properties window where you've got this environment variables button that you can click on. And then under system variables, you're just going to want to find the path, click on that, click edit, and then you're going to want to add a new system environment variable, and you're going to want to put the path to the bin folder inside the CC65 folder. So in Windows Explorer, you can just click in the address bar to highlight the full path, copy it, and then you can just paste it into, uh, into the edit environment variable window. As you can see, I already have it in my path, so I don't need it again, but you just do that. Then you just click okay a bunch of times. 
and now it's added to your system environment variables. If you're on Linux, then you would probably edit the .bashrc or equivalent file in your home folder and append the path to your path environment variable in there. Um, if you are using Linux, you're probably versed enough that you know how to do that. But if not, you know, just, just do an internet search for it. It'll tell you how to get it done. All right, so that takes care of the second step. Downloading the CC65 compiler and adding the bin folder to our path environment variable so that we can access these easily on the command line. Now, this next step is kind of optional. Uh, I'm going to download GNU Make for Windows so that I can run make files on Windows. Now, you can just as easily accomplish the same thing with, for example, a Windows uh, batch file uh, because we're not going to have very complicated compilation commands. So if you can't or don't want to install make, then again, you can probably just get by with Windows batch files instead. If you're on Linux, it probably comes with make already installed, so you're probably not even going to need to go through the step of downloading and installing it. But if you're on Windows and you don't have it, then you're going to want to grab it. All right, so I think I want this one. Make for Windows GNU Win32. Yep, this looks like the right web page. Looks like it's straight out of the 1990s. Very basic. Okay, so download the setup program. That is the one I want because I'm feeling lazy and I want it to just do the work for me. So under description and download, I'll take the complete package except sources. Now this, when I did it the first time, downloaded very, very slowly. Is it going to download very slowly again? No, this time it was quick. Okay. So, uh, bringing my folder back up. There we go. You would just run this and you literally just go through, it's just an installer. So you just go through the steps of basically hitting next, 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 next. It'll automatically install GNU Make for Windows for you. And it will then shut up phone. Hang on, let me mute my phone. I don't need it popping off while I'm trying to record tutorials. I never care about what it has to tell me anyway. All right. And the installer should automatically add the binary for this to your path, your system path environment variable. So you shouldn't even need to uh, do that manually like we did with the CC65 compiler. And you can check by just, excuse me, you can check by just typing in make and if it worked, it should tell you something like no target specified and no make file found stop. And uh, if it didn't work, it'll just complain that it doesn't know what you're talking about when you type in make. So you can just check it by typing that in on the terminal. Next, let me share with you the folder structure that I use for my projects. You don't necessarily have to copy this exactly, although it is, in my opinion, a pretty good folder structure. So uh, can serve as an example if you don't already have one that you like to use. So I have a different folder for each of my projects that I'm working on. And in the root of that folder, I'll have my source files, as well as my make file that I use for compilation. And then I have a few subfolders. I have a lib folder, or short for library, into which I'll put any third party library files that uh, I need in order to compile my program. And then ink for include, in which I put any header files from third party libraries that I need to compile my program. And then a build folder is where I'm going to um, have my compilation process output the executable file that will be run by the Commander X16 emulator and in the end should also run just as well on actual Commander X16 hardware. I highly recommend that you separate your output executable and any assets that it needs, any graphic and sound files and any other kind of files from your source files and any other input files that you need to do your compilation. Because if you mix the two up in the same folder, you have your source and input files in the same folder as your assets and stuff, then it becomes very confusing and messy trying to differentiate them from each other and keep them separated. So it's very good 
practice to have a separate build folder which you target for for the output of your compilation process and all the assets your program needs to run. So for demonstration purposes, I just have a very simple hello world program here. All right, so we pull in the uh, CC65 compiler suite provided CX16 header file, uh, standard io.h, just so that we can printf hello world. We are going to replace standard io.h with our own much better text to drawing routine in a future video, but for the time being, for demonstration purposes, we'll just use this. And wait.h, which is going to provide us a function that is basically going to sync our program so that it runs at a steady 60 frames per second. And I just pulled that straight out of the Commander X16C programming tutorials that I linked to in the previous video. So all we're going to do is uh, turn on 320 by 240 mode so that we're running at that resolution instead of 640 by 480. This is probably a good point to have a side note. My library is basically written assuming that the game it is supporting is running in 320 by 240 resolution. This really gives us a lot of breathing room in our memory and relieves some of the pressure off of the very limited amount of memory that we have to work with when the screen that we're displaying is a quarter the size of the default resolution. So you really get a big advantage in terms of uh, memory pressures by running in 320 by 240 resolution instead of 640 by 480. And in my opinion, this isn't even really a problem to run at this lower resolution because basically all of the game consoles of the era, like the NES and the SNES and the Sega Genesis and the Sega Master System, they all ran at this screen resolution or one very close to it. So since the whole goal is to do retro game programming anyway, this just makes it all the more authentically retro. Now I am aware that there were PC games of the era that ran at 640 by 480. Uh, and so if you're really gunning for that higher 640 by 480 resolution, then if you want to use my library, you're, gonna, you're probably going to have to make some modifications to make it work because it is going to assume 320 by 240. Just wanted to give that little note. Uh, and then we just call the printf hello world, and then we just enter an endless loop where we loop at 60 frames per second until we terminate the emulator. So... Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the make file. It's very simple. None of the make files that we build are going to have much complexity to them, which is one of the nice things about doing programming for the Commander X16. You don't really need to get all that complicated with the build process for your programs. So we define our compiler as CL65, which is one of the executables in that bin folder we put in our path environment variable. We call that the capital O flag turns on optimization, which is going to be extremely important for making the outputted code more efficient and run faster. So we're never going to want to forget to turn the optimization flag on. The dash small o lets us target a specific path and file name for our output executable. So we're going to put it in our build folder, and you can call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it test.prg. The dash t, cx16, informs the compiler to target the commander x16 uh, architecture for its executable so that it will run on the commander x16. And then we just give it the input source files that we need to compile our program. So I'll go ahead and open the terminal window here, which is very determined to open on my other screen every time. And then, now that we have our make file, just run make, and it will automatically execute this line for us, and it has built test.prg in our build folder. Again, if you didn't want to install make on your system, just make a batch file that has this same command in it and execute that instead. That, that would honestly work just as well. All right, and so we go to the build folder. And inside there, we see that there's another make file. But this one's a little different because in this one, we have not put instructions for how to compile our project. 
but for how to run it. And honestly, I don't even need this uh, that line there at the top for this make file. <clears throat> All right, so what we're doing is we're telling it to run the x16 emulator. So in my specific case, the emulate the folder with the emulator is located three folders up from here. So if I go up one, two, three. Then we see that this has the x16mu folder in it, and that within that is the x16mu executable. So just replace this path with whatever the correct relative path is to the x16 emulator on your system, or I'm pretty sure you could just use an absolute path in here as well. That should work just as well. The dash prg tells it to load in our test program as it executes. And then the dash run tells it to execute our test program immediately upon running. So all we have to do is enter our build folder, run make, and because the uh, run rule is the only rule in our make file, then we don't even have to specify make run. It'll just automatically execute the run rule. And as you can see, it executed the Commander X16 emulator we have two indications that it is running our program. One, you can see that it's much more zoomed in than it was the last time we ran it. That's because we're running a 320 by 240 resolution now. And we can see that it printed out our hello world text. So everything worked. And that is the basic folder structure and setup with the make files and such that I have. We're going to expand that a little bit once we pull in the ZSOM library, but that pretty much sums up the basic idea. Feel free to use that as an example for your own projects if you don't already have your own setup that you prefer to use. Now we're going to need one more thing before we're fully set up, and that's our sound library. As I discussed at the beginning of this video, I'm sticking with ZSound for now, but I am open to trying to switch to the uh, ZSM kit, if somebody can help me out with figuring out how to compile and use that uh, with my, my C-based programs. So in the meantime, I'll go ahead and search for ZSound Commander X16, which has brought up the one that I want as the top result, 0 byte org ZSound. All right, so go ahead and just download this however you want, whether you clone it on the command line or just download the zip. I've already done this. And then you unzip it, or you know, if you clone it, then you just get the folder, and you'll have zsound.main here. Now, this contains a make file, and by default, it's not going to have the files that you need to include in your project in order to use it. Now, right now, I do have those files, like in the lib folder. Oh, never mind. No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> so this is actually a good example. In the lib folder here, you can see that aside from a readme.txt, there's nothing in here. But once we run make to compile the zsound library, the lib folder will have a zsound.lib file in it, which we're going to need to pull into our projects in order to use zsound's features. And the include folder, in this case, already has a couple of header files, which we're also going to need. Now, here is a little bit of a wrinkle. This make file is written to work on Linux-based systems. I spent some time tinkering around with it, trying to modify it to run properly on a Windows system. And I'm sure it can be done, but I got impatient and just gave up before I managed to get it into shape to where it would run on a Windows computer. So what I ended up doing is a little silly. I actually just downloaded the ZSound library onto one of my Linux computers, compiled it there, and then copied the .lib file and the header files over onto my Windows computer so that I could use them that way. And that's perfectly fine. Even if you compile it on a Linux computer, there's nothing stopping you from using the resulting library file on a Windows computer. Now that's all well and dandy for me, but if you're watching this, maybe you don't have a Linux computer that you, use, you can use to compile this. So in case that is true for you, I'm going to go ahead and include a, okay, why is Slack popping off? I thought I closed Slack, gosh dang it. 
moment, please. Okay, I apologize for that little interruption. As I mentioned, my primary computer died and I'm still getting this backup computer all set up the way I want it. So I do apologize if this presentation is slightly more scattered than I would prefer to have it. Okay, so as I was saying, I will include a link to a, uh, a download of an environment that is already set up, including with the pre-compiled Zsound library file that you will need in order to uh, in order to compile and run a program with a setup like mine so that even if you're unable to compile the zsound library yourself you'll have what you need to get up and running so no need to worry about that i'll get that taken care of and uh, if in the future i do end up switching to using a zsm kit instead then uh, if there's anything that needs to be done to help people get that set up i'll take care of that as well but in the meantime, uh, regardless of how you do it, once you have the header files and the .lib file for zsound, you're going to need to include them in your project. So I've set up an example two here, and this time, instead of the lib and include, or rather ink folder being, uh, being empty, I've copied the zsound.lib into my lib folder here, and I've copied the necessary header files, pcmplayer.h and zsmplayer.h, into my ink folder here. And I've updated the make file so that the compilation command has been updated as necessary to compile with the uh, zsound files brought in. So we have dash i to make the compiler aware of where our includes are, and in this case it's just the ink directory, a dash capital L to make our compiler aware of our library folder, and in this case it's lib. And then we just also add zsound.lib to the end of the input files that we need in order to compile our project. So still very easy, very simple compilation command to get this working. And then just to demonstrate how easy it is to use the zsound library to play sound and music, uh, I brought in the PCM player and ZSM player header files. You'll need those. Uh, these are just some defines for uh, indicating some memory addresses and high RAM banks. Uh, I'll just kind of gloss over this a little bit for now and not get into the details too much at the moment. Uh, just add a function for loading a file off of the SD card, or in this case our hard drive, into the Commander X16's high RAM. Then we just define essentially a boolean, but in this case, unsigned car for whether uh, music is currently playing or not. Here we have our 320 by 240 resolution again and our hello world. And now we get to the new code for loading and playing sound files. And you can see how incredibly easy it is to do with Zsound. So we just define which uh, bank in HiRAM we want to load our music into. Uh, then we use the load file to high RAM function defined here. In order to load our background music, bgm.zsm file into our music bank, then you just call the zsm init function, and then zsm start music with the high RAM bank that your music is in, and then the banked RAM address is that the, just the address that banked RAM is in, uh, in your um, low RAM. And then we do the same thing for the sound effect, call PCM init, and then PCM trigger digi with pretty much the same thing as before, the bank for our sound effects, and then the banked RAM address. And then we just add a couple of things to our loop here. Uh, once per frame in your main game loop, you just call PCM play in order to play your sound effect that you have running, and then ZSM play in order to play your music. And so we can go ahead and demonstrate that this compiles. And then go into our build folder, where we can see this time we actually have some assets, and not just our test.prg. bgm.zsm is our music file, and I think that this comes from a Street Fighter game but I'm not at all a Street Fighter expert, so I'm not 100% sure. And then test8.zcm, which is the sound effect we're going to play to demonstrate. 
is just a sound effect from one of my other indie game projects that just sounds like a jet engine taking off or that kind of thing. Uh, it, another interesting or rather convenient thing about the Z Sound library is it comes with utilities for converting modern sound formats into the music and sound effects formats that the Commander X16 and the Z Sound library require in order to know how to parse and process them. And I'll cover how to use those utilities in a future video. With that, just to prove that it works, let's go ahead and run our little demonstration program. Is the most beautiful set of sounds that has ever been heard by mankind. In all seriousness, it's actually really cool to me getting sound and music to play on the Commander X16 so easily. Uh, the only reason that the sound effect might have sounded like it stuttered a little bit there is because it, ex uh, it ran the emulator on my other screen, and then I panickedly dragged it over onto this screen, and dragging it caused the sound effect to stutter a little bit, but that doesn't ordinarily happen, so that's the only reason for that. And that pretty much covers how to set up your environment to be like mine. Again, if you don't have your own setup that you already like to use, you can emulate this one or just use it as an example. Um, not really too much else to say about it. I guess there's also the subject of what kind of editor that you use to edit your code. I I'm literally just using Notepad++. I find that that's quite adequate and I don't really need anything else to do coding on the Commander X16 personally. But uh, you can certainly use something more advanced if you want. For example, you could load it in as a VS Code project with C extensions installed to get some you know, better IntelliFence functionality going and that sort of thing. Uh, I would not dissuade anybody from doing something like that. But personally, I don't even find that it's really all that necessary. Just a basic text editor with nice uh, syntax highlighting, uh, I find is quite good enough. That's another thing that's nice about Commander X16 programming is the tool chain is just so simple. Uh, instead of having a, a development stack that's a mile wide and a mile deep, all you need is just a handful of pretty simple tools and you're good to go. It's actually quite refreshing as somebody who is mired in the god-awful world of modern software development for my job. Uh, but anyway, so... Uh, I guess last words that I will uh, that I will impart this video are next time we're going to actually start delving into working on our library. Well, I mean, for me, the library is basically already functional, but we're going to uh, we're going to go through how it's set up and stuff together. Uh, so get down into the nitty gritty of building a Commander X sixteen graphics library to help give us an abstraction layer and make it a little easier to work with sprites and tiles and text display and all that sort of thing. In the meantime, between now and when I release that next video, if you have not done so already and you're not already familiar with how to interact with HiRAM, VRAM, sprites, tiles, and the Vera through C using the CC65 compiler suite, then I highly, highly recommend that you go through the tutorials that I linked to in the previous video because they really do an excellent job of explaining how that works and giving example code that you can run and play with to really get a good feel for how it all works. And the reason I recommend that is I'm pretty much going to assume that you have most of that knowledge going into the next set of videos. I'm not really going to do a whole lot of explaining how that works. I might explain a little bit of it, but I'm not going to go into too much depth. So you can basically regard that as prerequisite knowledge for when we get into the next set of videos and build a little bit of a more advanced library for us to use. And it would just be kind of redundant for me to cover all of that again when there's already a, a perfectly good tutorial that does it for me. All right, so that's going to do it for this one. Thank you very much 
for watching, as always. I hope that this has been useful to somebody. And next time, we're going to get into the nitty gritty. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I will see you next time for some more retro game development goodness.